Good evening, good evening, everyone. Come on, let's stand together. Worship the Lord. From the darkness, I called your name. Into darkness, your mercy came. You called me out, lifted me up. How great is your love. For my weakness, you took my shame, buried my burden in fields of grace. You called me out. Lifted me up, how great is your love. From the heights of heaven, you stepped down to earth. In a sin perfection, gave your life for us and we are amazed. Yes, we stand in awe, for we have been changed by the power of the cross. How great, how great, how great is your love. How great, how great, how great is your love. How great, how great, how great. In your kindness, you lead me home. In your presence, where I belong. You called me out, lifted me up. How great is your love. From the high of heaven, you step down to earth, in a sin perfection, gave your life for us, and we are amazed, yes, we stand in awe, for we have been changed by the power of the cross, how great, how great, how great. God like you, a love so true, there has never been, there will never be, a God like you, a love so true, there has never been, there will never be, a God like you. A love so true, there has never been, there will never be a God like you, a love so true. Yeah, how great, how great, how great is your love, how great, how great. How great is your love, how great, how great, how great is your love for us, oh Lord. How great, how great, how great is your love. 
How great, how great, how great is your love. How great, how great, how great is your love for us. Thank you, Lord. Never fails me all my days. I've been held in your hands yeah. from the moment that I wake up until I lay my head. I will sing of the goodness of God. Come on, sing that again. I love you, Lord. Oh, your mercy never fails me all my days. We've been held in your hand from the moment that I wake up until I lay my head. Oh, I will sing of the goodness of God. All my life you have been faithful. All my life you have been so, so good. With every breath that I am able, oh, I will sing of the goodness of God. I love your voice. You have led me through the fire in darkest night. You are close like no other. I've known you as a father. I've known you as a friend. I have lived in the goodness of God. All my life you have been faithful. All my life you have been so, so good. With every breath that I am able, oh, I will sing of the goodness of God. For your goodness is running after, running after me. For your goodness is running after, it's running after me. With my life laid down, I'm surrendered now. I give you everything. Your goodness is running after, it's running after me. Come on, your goodness. Your goodness is running after, running after me. Your goodness is running after, it's running after me. With my life laid down, I'm surrendered now. I give you everything. Your goodness is running after, running after me. All my life you have been faithful. Yes, you have. All my life you have been so, so good. With every breath that I am able, oh, I will sing. Of the goodness of God, oh, I will sing of the goodness of God. Cause your goodness is running now, it's running now to me. Your goodness is running now, it's running now to me. With my life laid down, I've surrendered now. I give you everything. Your goodness is running after, it's running after me. 
Your goodness is running after, running after me. Your goodness is running after, it's running after me. With my life laid down, I'm surrendered now. I give you everything. Your goodness is running after, running after me. And all my life you have been faithful. Thank you, Jesus. All my life you have been so, so good. With every breath that I am made, oh, I will sing of the goodness of God. Oh, I will sing of the goodness of God. Thank you, Lord. You are worthy, Lord. Jesus, Jesus, precious Lord, none on the earth or heavens above that I have found more beautiful you are my treasure my great reward I just want to move your heart it's all I want to do I just want to stand in awe Pour my love on you, no matter how much the cost. I freely give it all to you, all to you. Your love made a way. Jesus, Jesus, my offering, all my ambitions, my hopes, my dreams, and here's my life, Lord, a sacrifice, oh, just to bless you, I just want to move your heart. It's all I want to do, I just want to stand in awe and pour my love on you, no matter how much the cost, I freely give it all to you. within your gaze right here in your presence God is where I want to stay oh just to dwell in your house waste my hours and my days on you all on you is it a fragrance then I'll pour my oil out is it a life laid down? Then here I give my vows. Is it a song I sing? Then here's every melody. Just tell me what moves you. Oh, tell me what moves you. Is it a fragrance? Then I'll pour my oil out. Is it a my vows. Is it a song I sing? Then here's every melody. Just tell me what moves you. Lord, tell me what moves you. Oh, tell me what moves you. Lord, tell me what moves you. I just want to move your heart. It's all I want to do. I just want to stand in awe and pour my love on you. No matter how 
much the cost I freely give it all to you all to you I just want to move your heart get caught within your gaze right here in your presence God is where I want to stay oh just to dwell in your house place my Is it a fragrance? Then I'll pour my oil out. Is it a life laid down? Then here I give my vow. Is it a song I sing? Then here's every melody. Just tell me what moves you. Oh, tell me what moves you. Oh, is it a fragrance? Then I'll pour my oil out. Is it life laid down? Then here I give my vows. Is it a song I sing? Then here's every melody. Oh, tell me what moves you, Lord. Oh, tell me what moves you. Just tell me what moves you. Oh, tell me what moves you. I just want to move your heart. It's all I want to do. I just want to stand in awe and pour my love on you. No matter how much the cost, I freely give it all to you. I just want to move your heart, get caught within your gaze right here in your presence. God is where I want to stay, oh, just to dwell in your house, waste my hours and my days on you, all on you. I just want to move your heart. It's all I want to do. I just want to stand in awe and pour my love on you. No matter how much the cost, I freely give it all to you. All to you. Father, that's our prayer tonight. We just offer up our sacrifice of praise just to move your heart, God. That's all I want to do. I just love that verse. I just want to move your heart and get caught within your gaze. You abide in the praises of your people. So, Lord, I thank you tonight, and I love you. With all my heart, all my soul, all my strength, we worship you, Jesus. And we ask your blessing, God, over the word tonight and our time together. In Jesus' name. And the church declares, amen and amen. Well, listen, do not be seated tonight. So you turn and greet some people and welcome to all of you joining us.
Hallelujah. Woo. If you wondered if I'm here, I'm here. Thank you, Jesus. We serve an awesome God. Amen. Amen. Hey, just a couple of quick announcements uh, today, tonight. The uh, Hey, big uh, happy anniversary to Pooch and Sherry. So uh, you're here celebrating by yourself, but that's okay. That's all right. Happy anniversary to you. Love you guys. Uh, the, uh, hey, this coming Sunday, we have a baptismal service, and so uh, we grew by one more tonight. Somebody else is getting baptized come Sunday. Amen. That's something to celebrate and rejoice about. And so I think we've got eight that are going to be baptized this Sunday. Remember, we do our baptismal service in between our 8.30 and our 11 o'clock service during the Sunday school hour. And so I just want to encourage you, if you're getting baptized, you want to wearing a pair of shorts, a dark t-shirt, and a towel to get baptized in. Uh, that way, uh, the, uh, the, for uh, modesty's sake, that's why we do the dark t-shirts <laughs> and all of that. So uh, come prepared for that, and then we'll meet over at the FLC right after first service, and we'll go over a few details before the baptismal time. Uh, so that will be happening. Then the beginning, the following Sunday on the 30th, we will start our I Am a Church Member uh, class. We've got 17 that are signed up presently. If you're interested in joining that class, there is still time. we got room for probably three or four more. Uh, Miss Karen will be leading that class. Uh, if you are interested in taking it, you want to get signed up tonight if you can. She'll be sending out some information later this week. Uh, that class will be meeting at the Family Life Center. Uh, just because of the size of the class. We don't have a space that's easy to get to, so that will be, they'll be meeting at the Family Life Center uh, beginning on October the 30th. I want to start with something that's not my message tonight. I just thought it was interesting in our men's texting group. How many in here are in my men's texting group? Amen. How many of you did your assignment today? You don't even remember what the assignment was, do you? Some of you. This is what the message, that the, the, we're in Psalm 47 today, And the very first verse says, Come, everyone, clap your hands, shout to God with joyful praise. And I dared them to take 10 seconds today to stand up and do it, to clap and shout and praise God. So, hey, let's stand up. Come on, 10 seconds of just praise this morning. Can we do it? Come on, let's do it. Yeah! Thank you, Lord. You are worthy, Jesus. We love you, Lord. We love you, Lord. Hallelujah. He is worthy. Thank you, Jesus. Praise his name. Hallelujah. I was riding with Cohen this morning, and uh, Cohen, I said, hey, we've got to do 10 seconds of praise. He said, what's that, Pappy? I said, we're going to clap for 10 seconds, and we're going to shout for Jesus. He said, let's do it. And so we're driving in the truck, and he's clapping, and we're praising, and we get home, and, and uh, we go into the bathroom. Tandy's getting ready. He said, Mimi, we got to do our praise. And he goes, show him how you do it, Pappy. And he, said, he starts clapping. And so we did another 10 seconds of praise with Tandy. That was fun this morning. Yeah, Miss Karen. We got his gaze. That's it. That's a good word. We caught his gaze. I love one of the gentlemen... Uh, in our texting group, he says, that was easy and it felt good doing it. Thanks for the reminder. You know, how easy is it to give God 10 seconds of praise your first thing in the morning, right? I mean, how is that to set the mood? I mean, we're closing the day with 10 seconds of praise, but what if we open the day with 10 seconds of praise? Hallelujah. Come on. All right, listen, we're going to jump back into our teaching tonight in the book of Acts. The series we're in is called Unstoppable Gospel. Tonight's message is called Words That Pierce, and we're starting in Acts chapter 2. We're going to read through verses 14 through 21 together. You guys ready? It says, Then Peter stepped forward with the 11 other apostles and shouted to the crowd, Listen carefully, all of you, fellow Jews and residents of Jerusalem. Make no mistake about this. These people are not drunk, as some of you are assuming. Nine o'clock in the morning is much too early for that. No, what you see was predicted long ago by the prophet Joel. In the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit upon all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions and your old men will dream dreams. 
In those days I will pour out my spirit, even on my servants, men and women alike, and they will prophesy. And I will cause wonders in the heavens above and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and clouds of smoke. The sun will become dark and the moon will turn blood red before the great and glorious day of the Lord arrives. But everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. You know, the first thing that I was captured by when I was reading this section of scripture was Peter's boldness. That's what really grabbed me was Peter's boldness. Because this is the same man that denied Jesus three times. This is the same man that hid himself in a room because of fear, right, of being found. This is the same man that basically gave up and returned to Galilee to go fishing, right? This is the same Peter, but now he's standing before thousands proclaiming the word of God with authority, just a different person. So as I, re- as I read this, I was reminded of our guideposts. Remember our guideposts. We're going to put them up for, on the screen for you. Number one, God has a plan for the gospel. Remember that? That he's going to take the gospel to the ends of the earth. That's the plan of God. He's got a plan for it. Number two, God has a vessel for the gospel. How many vessels of the gospel in the room tonight? Amen. Every one of us is a vessel of the gospel. And finally, God's provision of power is needed to advance the gospel to the ends of the earth. So I thought about this as I was reading what changed in Peter's life. From the time he was denying Christ, he was hiding from the Jews, he was fishing back in Galilee, returned, what changed? What caused Peter to go from cowering disciple to bold apostle? And the only thing in Peter's life to change over the past 50 days was the outpouring of the Holy Spirit in Acts chapter 2. Peter received power when the Holy Spirit came upon him. However, it wasn't for his benefit, but for the advancement of the gospel. Remember that, that the reason we're empowered is to advance the gospel to the ends of the earth. Upon receiving the empowering of the Holy Spirit, Peter went to work, right? I mean, they received it. We read in Acts chapter 2 that the Spirit of God descended on them. They all began to speak in other tongues as the Holy Spirit gave them the utterance. They stepped out to where the crowd was, and Peter went to work proclaiming the gospel of Jesus Christ. Peter does something interesting in Joel 2, 28 through 32. Uh, And I don't know if I put that in there. Did I put that scripture in there, guys? I don't think I did. Upon receiving the empowering of the Holy Spirit, uh, he went to work by referencing the, the, the prophet Joel. So you think to yourself, okay, why is, why is Peter referencing an Old Testament prophet? Peter ties the unusual events of Pentecost to a prophecy that was spoken by the prophet Joel that was penned 800 years before this took place. So what Peter is explaining is what you're witnessing is what Joel prophesied 800 years ago. In it, he references the outpouring of the Holy Spirit being poured out upon all people. This was a significant shift. So in my New Living Translation study Bible, there was an excellent note, and I want to show you the note that was written because it makes a lot of sense. It says, the outpouring of the Holy Spirit in the Old Testament had been largely reserved for the spiritual and national leaders of Israel. Under the new covenant, however, every believer is anointed to be priest and king to God. So we see a shift. The Holy Spirit, the empowering spirit, we, see it, we oftentimes saw it right in the Old Testament. The Spirit of God would come upon Samson and he would do great and mighty feats or it would come upon Gideon and he would do great feats. So we saw the Spirit of God come upon these national leaders and spiritual leaders. But what, what Peter was saying is that there is a shift that's coming. The, apostle jo- or the prophet Joel saw it. And said, in the last days, that empowering spirit is not just going to be reserved for the spiritually elite, but it's actually going to be poured out on all of his people that would receive it. And so he's shifting their mindset. You see, the responsibility of proclaiming the gospel was shifting. It was no longer going to be reserved for the spiritual elites, but it was now going to be the responsibility of every believer to carry the truth of God's word to the nations. There's a shift happening. And and I think today, I I don't know that we as the church have fully grasped it. 
that the outpouring of the Holy Spirit is proof that you and I are now responsible for taking the gospel to the nations. The Spirit of God is proof. The outpouring of the Spirit is proof of it. You see, Peter didn't spend a lot of time navigating and explaining the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, right? He just used that little section. He just said, the Spirit of God is poured out. These people aren't drunk. What you're witnessing is this prophecy coming to pass before your eyes. And then, really, he just moved past it. I mean, most of us would still want to, we'd be fascinated by that part of it. What is this? We're all hearing him in our languages. What is this outpouring of the Spirit of God, the tongues of fire? We would all still be fascinated by it. And Peter moves past it because what Peter understood is that empowering spirit was to proclaim the word of God. And so as, he's, as this is happening, he moves into the real message that he's anointed to preach. So we're going to look tonight at the gospel that Peter preached. Because it is the same gospel that you and I have been anointed of the Holy Spirit to preach ourselves. So let's look at it together. Let's start in Acts 2.22. It says, People of Israel, listen. God publicly endorsed Jesus the Nazarene by doing powerful miracles, wonders, and signs through him, as you well know. So let me start with this statement. There is no gospel apart from recognizing Jesus as the Son of God. There's no gospel. There is no gospel that is disconnected from Jesus being the Son of God. If somebody is preaching a gospel where Jesus is not the Son of God, it is not the gospel. And so we have to recognize Jesus. Peter recognizes who Jesus is. You know, Sunday I pointed to two occasions in the book of Matthew where God vocally affirmed Jesus as his Son, right? We looked at two verses Sunday morning about that. But in addition to God validating who Jesus was, in addition, God did many mighty miracles, signs, and wonders through Jesus to publicly affirm that Jesus was endorsed by God. You know, I love that. that It's funny because I don't know in in any of the other translations that it uses that phrase, how God publicly endorsed, right? Right? I think that's just an interesting word that the the New Living Translation chose to use there. But in, in essence, that the signs, wonders, and miracles that were happening were endorsing who Jesus was. In addition, the word declares in Acts 4, 11 through 12, that there is no name under heaven by which men must be saved, but that of the name of Jesus. So we need a Savior, and that Savior is Jesus. He's the beginning of the gospel. He is the gospel. You can't preach the gospel without recognizing Jesus. So that's the first thing that Peter did, is he he made Jesus the central focus. But then he moves the message into what we're really familiar with, the death, burial, and resurrection. So in Acts 2, 23 through 24, it said, But God knew what would happen, And his prearranged plan was carried out when Jesus was betrayed. With the help of lawless Gentiles, you nailed him to a cross and killed him. But God released him from the horrors of death and raised him back to life, for death could not keep him in its grips. Amen? So let me say this. Here's another point tonight. The gospel message will always include an affirmation of Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection. Always. You're not preaching the gospel if you're not mentioning his death, burial, and resurrection. you got to recognize who Jesus is. you got to affirm who Jesus is. And you've got to talk about the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Or it's not the gospel. Notice that's where Peter started. Peter didn't see. He opened up with Joel just to, just to silence the crowd. Listen, he said, this was a miracle. What you see happening, the, 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 the Spirit of God being poured out was a miracle prophesied by Joel. That was a powerful moment. But he moved quickly into the message that they needed to hear. How many know that this is the message? The death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ is the message that people need to hear. And it is probably the message that we most avoid sharing with people. But it is the message of salvation, this message. To deny his death or his resurrection is to deny the truth of God's word. 
See, without the shedding of blood, Hebrews tells us there's no forgiveness of sin. And without the resurrection, there is no hope. So you cannot, you cannot take apart, you cannot leave out the crucifixion, you cannot leave out the resurrection. Together they form the gospel. And we must point people to his substitutionary death on the cross and the miracle of his resurrection as first fruits from the dead. And that's what Peter was doing. He was proclaiming the gospel. But what Peter does next is really kind of interesting to me. In Acts 2, 25 through 28, he begins to, to reach back and tie, reach back to the Old Testament. And there's a reason that he does this, but let's read about what he says in Acts 2, 25 through 28. It says, King David said this about him. I see that the Lord is always with me. I will not be shaken, for he is right beside me. No wonder my heart is glad and my tongue shouts his praises. My body rests in hope. For you will not leave my soul among the dead or allow your Holy One to rot in the grave. You have shown me the way of life and you will fill me with the joy of your presence. You know, one thing that I teach in our ISOM class, uh, the, uh, uh, Pastor Mike, he gets the privilege of doing the Old Testament and I'm glad he has to do the Old Testament because that's a lot more books of the Bible than I have to cover in the New Testament. That <laughs> survey. But I got 27 books of the Bible but to, to cover. But when we're, when we're in this class, I always tell them this. It's important to know who your audience is. It's important to know who your audience is. Each of the gospel writers wrote with a particular audience in mind. Right? Matthew wrote to Jews and Luke wrote to Gentiles. And so you can, you can kind of look through the gospel and you can kind of see that they're writing to particular audiences. When Peter got up to preach on the day of Pentecost, he was standing in the epicenter of Jewish tradition. All right? He was talking primarily to Jews. And so as he's talking there, it bears to reason that connecting Jesus to the Old Testament was going to be paramount to winning them to Christ. Because the Old Testament is their gospel, right? There is no New Testament at this point. So they've got to show them Jesus. They got to show them the Messiah. He's got to show them the Messiah through the Old Testament. And so he reaches back into the Psalms there and he shows them from the Old Testament who Jesus is. Peter points to one particular Psalm to do this, one that proved that Jesus' resurrection was foretold long ago. However, not only did Peter lean into the Old Testament for proof, which had been monumental in their eyes to lean into the Old Testament. And there was a lot more scripture that Peter could have used. That's just the one that he used to, to prove that Jesus was resurrected from the dead. He could have used all kinds of others, but he used that one in particular. But the next thing that he did was to bolster his claims was that he referenced a person that they deeply admired. So they highly revered the gospel, right? The Old Testament, that's the book, the Torah, the law. That was their, that was their Bible. I mean, that, that he wanted to reference that. But more importantly, they loved David. They loved King David. I mean, King David was, I mean, you put Moses and King David, man, they were on pedestals in the eyes of the Jews. You know, so King David was a big deal to them. And so he uses an assertion that King David makes about the Messiah in verses 29 through 35. Listen to what he says. He says, dear brothers, think about this. You can be sure that the patriarch David wasn't referring to himself, for he died and was buried, and his tomb is still here among us. And it is. If, you've been to, if you ever go on a trip to Israel, you go on the tour, they take you to the tomb of David, and you can go in and see where he's buried. But he said, but he was a prophet, and he knew God had promised with an oath that one of David's own descendants would sit on his throne. David was looking into the future and speaking of the Messiah's resurrection. He was saying that God would not leave him among the dead or allow his body to rot in the grave. God raised Jesus from the dead, and we are all witnesses of this, now he is exalted to the place of highest honor in heaven at God's right hand. And the Father, as he had promised, gave him the Holy Spirit to pour out upon us. Just as you see and hear today, 
For David himself never ascended into heaven, yet he said, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit in the place of honor at my right hand until I humble your enemies, making them a footstool under your feet. Hey, listen, you can't get much better of a letter of recommendation than King David, right? (laughs) I mean, even even in their dialogue, he says, we are all witnesses. We are all witnesses of his resurrection. And he just blew past it because he knew that carried zero weight with them. The people, they didn't care. They did, they, did, they, had no, they did not care that those 12 guys had seen Jesus resurrected. But they were interested in what the Old Testament had to say. And they were very interested in what King David might have said about him. They didn't necessarily care about what he had to say at this point. But they sure did were interested when he, and I think what's beautiful about Peter, he knew his audience. As he began to proclaim the word of God, he knew his audience, and he began to tie these things together. So Peter, knowing his audience, referenced both the Old Testament and King David to bolster his position regarding Jesus and his death, burial, and resurrection. Now here's where I want to spend a little time tonight. In verse 36 through 37, after he finishes this dialogue, this is what Peter says. He says, so let everyone in Israel know for certain that God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, to be both Lord and Messiah. And notice verse 37. Peter's words pierced their hearts. And they said to him and to the other apostles, brothers, what should we do? Now, I don't know. I mean, I, I've, you know, I've read some powerful sermons in my life that people have preached you know, that, you know, D.L. Moody and Smith Wigglesworth, and, you know, you think about uh, the, 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 the message, sinners in the hands of an angry God, you should read that. I mean, I've read some powerful, powerful sermons before, heard a lot of them, but I'm looking at this sermon that probably lasted all of about, what, two minutes? And it says that in two minutes, and all that he did, all that he did was recognize who Jesus was, preach to them the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, and then affirm to them that this was foretold in the Old Testament. And it says that the words that Peter spoke pierced their hearts, and they began to cry out to God, or cry out to them, what should we do? It says that Peter's words pierced their hearts, not his presentation, not his charisma, It wasn't because Peter was extremely convincing. It wasn't those things. It was his words, the words that rolled off of his tongue. Why? Because there's power in those words. There's power in the gospel. Again, the focus isn't on Peter's ability, but on the effectiveness of the gospel. You see, there's power in the word of God. You know, Isaiah 55, 10 through 11, this is one of my favorite passages. It says, the rain and snow come down from the heavens and stay on the ground to water the earth. They cause the grain to grow, producing seed for the farmer and bread for the hungry. It is the same with my word. I sent it out and it always produces fruit. It will accomplish all I want it to and it will prosper everywhere I send it. Why? The word is powerful. It wasn't, it wasn't Peter that pierced their hearts. It was the word that pierced their hearts. In Hebrews 4.12, it says, For the word of God is alive and powerful. It is sharper than the sharpest two-edged sword, cutting between soul and spirit, joint and marrow. It exposes our innermost thoughts and desires. You know you know, I, the, you, we stop to think about it. He, the word of God is described as a sword, not a marshmallow. <laughs> think about it, right? I mean, you throw a marshmallow, it just bounces off people. But I feel like that's how we oftentimes present the word of God. We're just bouncing marshmallows off people. But in reality, when we preach the word of God, if we understand that there's power in the word and the word of God can do these things, the word of God can cut between soul and spirit. It can cut between joint and marrow. It can expose the innermost thoughts and desires. When we realize that is not, we don't preach a marshmallow gospel. 
We preach a gospel that has the power to penetrate people's innermost thoughts and feelings and bring conviction of the Holy Spirit. That's the word that we preach, but we're not doing it. It's the word that's powerful. As believers, we're called to preach and proclaim the gospel, right? The Bible says, beautiful are the feet of those who bring the good news, but it is the word itself that pierces men's hearts. We are responsible for the delivery, not the outcomes. We have to deliver it. We have to bring the word. We've got to share. We've got to recognize who Jesus is. We've got to preach to them the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. We've got to do that. We've got to deliver the word. But we're not responsible for the outcomes of that word. God promises the outcome. My word will go forth and accomplish what I will and desire it to. But we have to carry the word to where it needs to go. That's the, that's the plan of the gospel. We are responsible for the delivery, not the outcome. It isn't our job to convince, but rather it is the Holy Spirit's work to convict and lead people into all truth. That's the Spirit's job. It's not my job. That's His job. But we, we have to bring the gospel. So here's another point. A heart that is pierced by the gospel is going to look to respond to it. You say, what do you mean by that? You know, if we're preaching the good news, we should always expect that the word of God is going to pierce men's hearts. We should believe that. If we believe that the word of God accomplishes what he wills and desires it to, if we believe that the word of God is a sword, when we preach the gospel, when we share our faith, when we share the gospel with people, we should expect that it's going to pierce the hearts of men. And that they're going to look to respond to it. Isn't that what happened when Peter preached? Is that he got done preaching the gospel and their response to it is, brothers, what should we do? What should we do? We should have that expectation. If we believe that the word of God can do this and we're carrying the word of God to people, we should believe this is going to happen. And so what happens next, and beginning in verse 38 through 41, it says, Peter replied... Each of you must repent of your sins and turn to God and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. Then you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. This promise is to you, to your children, and those far away, all who have been called by the Lord our God. Then Peter continued preaching for a long time, strongly urging all his listeners, save yourselves from this crooked generation. Those who believe what Peter said were baptized and added to the church that day, about 3,000 in all. Here's a final question tonight we're going to resonate on. What is the purpose of preaching the good news if it is not to bring people to repentance? What is the purpose of preaching the good news if it's not to bring people to repentance. That's the purpose. It is to bring people to repentance. I can't make people repent, but I can bring the gospel, and the gospel can do its work and pierce men's hearts. And when asked what to do, we need to call people to repentance. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Peter said, repent of your sins and turn to God. That's not a very popular message today. In fact, when I was looking at Peter's response there, when I scrolled back to verse 38, when they, when they said, what should we do? And Peter's explanation of each of you must repent of your sins and turn to God, his church probably wouldn't grow very, very quickly in the United States because that's not the message that a lot of, them, a lot of people want to hear. They want a feel-good message. They want encouragement. They don't want to be told that they need to repent of their sins. But that is the essence of the gospel. Repentance is the essence of the gospel. In fact, it is central to the gospel message. Remember, Jesus himself told his disciples in Luke 24, 47, he says, it was also, it was also written that this message would be proclaimed in the authority of his name to all the nations beginning in Jerusalem. Notice the message. This is forgiveness of sins for all who repent. That's it. Repentance. What is the purpose of proclamation? That, that is the message that God has empowered us to proclaim. That's the message. 
we recognize Jesus, who he is. He is not just another good preacher. He wasn't just a, a good rabbi. He wasn't just anyone. He was the son of God, right? He recognized by his signs, wonders, and miracles. And isn't it interesting that after Jesus, when Jesus left, he said, now all authority in heaven and earth has been given unto me. Now go and make disciples of all nations. And notice as the disciples went that signs, wonders, and miracles followed the preaching of the word. Notice that. Again, the miracles are tied to the mission. It's not just, it's not just having power in order to propagate ourselves or promote ourselves. The miracles are always tied to the mission. The mission is to pierce men's hearts so that they will consider their own eternal salvation so that they will cry out unto God, what should I do? And then there'll be a call to repentance that says repent and turn to God. We saw that happen Sunday morning where a lady gave her life to Christ. Repent and turn to God. And then he goes on to be baptized, to be filled with the Holy Spirit. You know, there's other things that happen. But when I look at the end, notice this, and I think it was just kind of interesting. In verse 40, and, and Hannah would have to go back to find this, but after it, this is all that happened, it says, Then Peter continued preaching for a long time, strongly urging all of his listeners, Save yourselves from this crooked generation. How many know that, that just coming to Christ is not enough? Because we still got to live in a crooked generation. We, get, we still got to live out our faith before God. So Peter continued preaching. But when I look at it, it says that Peter said there were baptized and added to the church that day about 3,000 people in all. I can't even imagine that. I can't, that's not, it's almost, I can't even fathom what that would be like. I mean, we got like eight people getting baptized on Sunday, and I'm trying to squeeze it in between two. I'm thinking 3,000. How do you baptize 3,000 people in a single day? I mean, I'd like to try, right? I'd like to give it a whirl and see if we can, we can make that happen. But the idea was this. Notice that we don't really see anything like this happen prior to this day. We kind of see this, some more of this happen after, though, don't we? But up until this, we don't really read about how 3,000 people came to God in a single day until after the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And listen, and, and here's the key. What's important about the, the, the empowering of the Holy Spirit and why it's being poured out on all of us is that, you know what, I can't, I can't baptize 3,000 people in a day. But we can because the Spirit of God isn't just poured out on me. It poured out on you. That is not just, I, and I believe that. I don't believe it was just Peter uh, standing there all day, and, you know, asking, you know, one of the other disciples, how many are we up to now? Right? 900. Woo, I need a break. You know, we got, there's a line, Peter. There's no breaks today. No, I don't think it was just Peter. I think it was, I think there was multitudes of people who were baptizing people in the river and they were getting down and getting baptized because they were all filled with the Spirit. Remember, all 120 in that upper room were filled with the Spirit of God that day. I believe they were all down there baptizing people into the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Whenever we read the book of Acts, I want you to understand this, and we're going to close tonight. There is a major shift that's happening in how the gospel is taken to the world. I mean, in the, in the Old Testament, God used prophets, and he used a prophet to go and proclaim to the nation a message, and then he would use a king to go proclaim a message to the nation. And so it was individuals. God would raise up a judge to proclaim the gospel or to lead Israel in that particular moment. And so we see individuals being used and being commissioned to take the gospel. But when we get to the book of Acts, the whole dynamic changes. And every one of us are filled with the Spirit of God, have now been commissioned to do that work. And why would that be? Because God said in his word that he would not, he's not willing that any should perish, but all would come to what? Repentance. And what is the goal of the gospel? Repentance. It's a call to repentance. It's to get people back to, to, to repent of their sins and turn back to God. That's the goal. And so we've got to share that. 
You know, there, there is a time you say, well, I'm just doing my best. I'm sharing an encouraging word with my friend every once in a while. You know, and hopefully they'll, they'll come to know Christ. They're not going to come to know Christ if you don't share it with them. You have to share with them the gospel. You know, I, I, it's funny. Have you ever had somebody that, like, that completely beats around the bush with you? You know exactly what they're wanting to ask you, and you let them. Have you ever done that? I mean, they're just like, they're completely, and you just know, you're just like, I'm not, I'm not, I know what they want, but I'm not going to do this. I'm going to wait for them just to come right out and ask me what it is that they're wanting to ask me. You know, but it's, it can be frustrating, right? But at the end of the day, think about this. How many people are, 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 are frustrated spiritually because we're beating around the bush, about the most important decision they could ever make in their whole life when it comes to eternity. And we're beating around the bush, telling them, well, you know, God can help you with this, and God can help you with that, and we completely avoid the gospel message, his death, burial, and resurrection, to repent of our sins and turn to God. That's the message that we've got to share with them. I had a, a family reach out to me. I did a funeral last year for a family uh, they don't attend our church, uh, and uh, this gentleman's wife had passed away, and uh, he's not doing well, and the family reached out and said, now, he's, un he's on hospice right now, and, he, they, and I said, is he, I mean, can he talk, and they're like, yeah, he can talk and things, and, 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 but he, they give him a couple weeks to live, and uh, they, he said, they, he asked for you to do the funeral. I said, That's always, I always find a, an honor and weird at the same time. But, but I told him, yeah, I mean, I would be honored to do that. And when I got up, I'm working on this message, right? And when this is happening, I'm, I'm, I'm texting this, this lady back and forth. And, uh, and as soon as I sent the last message, the Lord said, you need to go and have a discussion with this man about the gospel. You need to go. So I texted her back and I said, can I come and see him? She goes, yeah, we would love that. So I'm going to go see him. So pray Friday. When I go to see this, he may be born again, I don't know. But all I know is that the Lord says, you need to go and share the gospel with him. Because this may be his last, and no beating around the bush, right? What if we approached everybody like I'm, I'm going to approach this guy? Everybody. Because we don't know. This guy, I know it's sad to think that he's only got a couple weeks to live. But listen, we don't know in this room, there may be people, people in our church that don't make it longer than he does. Because we have no idea. It's appointed unto men once to die and then the judgment. Well, I don't know. It can be me tomorrow. I have no idea. Why are we beating around the bush with the most important question that needs to be answered in people's lives? God has empowered us to ask the question. And he's given us the gospel. All you got to do, listen, seriously, all you got to do is carry it to him. And then let the word do its work. Amen? Let's stand together. Thank you, Jesus. Father, we thank you tonight. Every head bowed in this room this evening. Father, we thank you tonight for your word. We thank you, God, that Jesus Christ came in the flesh, the Son of God, the second person of the Trinity. Father, we thank you tonight for Jesus, who, who was willing to go to the cross and die on the cross for our sins. He was willing to be buried and raised from the dead that we might have eternal life with him. Lord, we're thankful for the gospel tonight. And Lord, it's my prayer that everyone in the room tonight, Father God, has, is, is, is right with God in the fact that they have repented of their sins and turned to God. But Lord, I pray that maybe, Lord, there might be those tonight who are here that have walked away or, Father, they've gotten off track. And Lord, tonight's message has challenged them. Tonight's message has challenged their heart to know that I need to get my life back on track with Jesus. So I'm going to pray for all of us, but if that's you tonight, if you say, that's me, I need to get my life back on track with Jesus, just slip your hand up. I'm going to pray for whoever tonight may need to get their life straight. Amen. I see your hand back there. Thank you. Anyone else? Thank you, Jesus. Father, I, I just thank you, God, for those that are raised their hands tonight, God, because I know that's not easy to do, to evaluate your own spiritual life and realize I need to get my life right with Jesus. Father, I pray tonight for them in Jesus' name. Father, that we, as we make a bold confession of our faith here together, Lord, in this room, that, Lord, they would reassert, Father, their love for you. And, Lord, that they would turn their eyes and their hearts back towards you. 
So can we just pray this prayer together as a church family? Father, in Jesus' name, forgive me of my sins and all of my failings. I know I've disappointed you and fallen short of your glory. I repent of my sins and I turn to you. I believe that Jesus died on the cross for my sins. He was buried and raised from the dead to give me eternal life. Lord, help me to live for you. In Jesus' name, amen. Come on, let's give the Lord some praise in this house. Amen. Father, we thank you. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. You're worthy. Father, we praise you tonight. We thank you, God, for your word. I ask your blessing, Father, over this congregation as they're released. God, I pray for their safety. I pray, God, for their direction. I pray for divine appointments this week, not just to to invite people to church, but divine appointments this week to help them to share the gospel with the people around them. Lord, no beating around the bush. Jesus is coming soon. We need to preach the word. And Lord, let the word do its work. In Christ's name, amen. Amen. Hey, if you need prayer, this altar is open.